I, I feel looking back that the land chose us more than anything else. We, we were just kind of looking for any real chance to do this. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Alchemy Podcast. I'm your host, Dana Davis. The Alchemy Podcast explores a happier and healthier future for all. Featuring conversations with thought leaders, scientists, and change makers, we'll explore topics at the intersection of individual wellness, social equity, and sustainability. Join us as we look to bridge the gap between personal, community, and planetary well being. Let's dive in. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to have here today with me, Richard Garcia from Alma Backyard Farms. Alma Backyard Farms is on a mission to reclaim lives of formerly incarcerated people, repurpose land into productive urban farms, and reimagine disenfranchised communities here in LA as a hub for transformation. But a bit about Richard, his passion to grow food comes from a long line of Filipino farmers. A Los Angeles native, Richard lives to see that no life or land is wasted in the city of Angels. He studied at St. John's Seminary College and has extensive experience in pastoral ministry inside of juvenile halls and prisons. As a pastoral minister, youth advocate, and urban farmer, Richard knows how growing food is a transformative way of bringing people together. And since, since completing his master's at Loyola Marymount University, Richard has incorporated principles of restorative justice into urban farming. Before launching Backyard Farms, Richard initiated garden programs for schools and restaurants. And not only that, he's trained the urban farmers at Alma Backyard Farms to create beautiful landscapes, install raised beds, and grow delicious food. Welcome to our show, Richard. We're so excited to have you here today. Good energy. I'm glad to be. <laughs> love that. Yeah, I love just hearing the story. I know I read a bio at the start of every one of these conversations, but I always like to ask, you know, the person who I'm speaking with to tell me and the listeners a bit about who you are, um, you know, what is Alma Farms and how you really got to where you are today. So just basically your story. So a bio on a website, you know, we learned this early on. Alma Backyard Farms is a nonprofit organization. And the first meeting that any prospective donor usually has is online. They check you out. All that information there is, 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 is begging to legitimize our work. Do you want the reflective answer? Or I want the reflective answer. Okay, you want the reflective <laughs> we answer? got the bio. We don't need the details yeah. of that stuff, but I want to hear who you are as an individual. I've been reflecting on, on purpose and what my purpose is. My mom, it's it's a year since her death, but but growing up she would always tell me you have to Im improve your life and and she came to the United States from the Philippines to do that to to better her life. I have a conviction that that I'm on this planet to help improve relationships by creating the space where relationships can be nurtured. And it's not just between people, it's between people and their spaces. Mm -hmm. How do you interact in, 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 in a space that's so familiar to you in a new way? So in terms of purpose, I, I believe I'm, I'm one who's, who's on this planet to help Im improve relationships and unlock those potentials in, in relationships. I'm currently in the process of unlocking my own potential as a new dad of a 10-month-old. My, my identity, if you will, has been in some blessed way shaken up because I'm, I'm, I'm learning to become a dad. Erica, who's my wife, I'm also learning to be a, a good husband and I want to be the best version of that. So those are like my primary relationships that, that probably help, help me recognize who I am. So I, I am who I am in relation to people who have died and people who are born people who are in my life today, the relationships help to, to give me identity. You know, my purpose in that is to, to be one who facilitates improvement. I am son, dad, and husband, and I grow food in order for people to be the better version of themselves and their relationships. So the purpose of us growing food is really relational. As much as to grow beautiful food, food that people could share at a table it's grown so that we have relationship with each other the food creates that so that that's that's my uh, identity as a as a grower it's it's really to grow relationships 
I love that. No, and I think that's so spot on. I really appreciate you starting off with who you are as a person because so much to what you're saying about like people look on at bios or, you know, <laughs> statutes or degrees or whatever that is. And so much of what we're trying to cultivate here is humanity and our similarities with each other through humanity. So I appreciate you starting off from that place of just um, real candid, um, a candid response. So thank you. Um, but I want to share a little bit more about Alma, Alma Backyard Farms um, with our community. If you could share, I had the opportunity this weekend actually to go and visit the farm and it's truly incredible. You know, like there's, you're talking a lot about a community and just your initial response. And it truly is that place. When you walk in, you see people just playing with their kids, running around, talking with each other, having lunch, buying goods. It's just truly an incredible space um, in, in the South area of Los Angeles. And so I wanted to learn more, if you could share, about what the programs you have at Alma Backyard Farms and maybe just a little bit about the farm in general. Alma in, in, in Spanish means soul. So like we, we are an urban farm and we have three core programs before I get to the programs, I, I want to say that we, we grow food to nourish the soul. How does that look, practically speaking? We work with folks who have been incarcerated, helping them reenter through job training. There is a therapeutic dimension of just working the earth, working with our hands. The space for conversation is a different one. That's one of our core programs, working with folks, helping them reenter after incarceration. Um, we have a program where we work with children ages pre-K to um, system impacted young adults in their 20s, helping them reconnect to the earth and develop a sense of environmental stewardship. Kids reconnect to their food. Adolescents reconnect to uh, a sense of work ethic. So that's our second core program, working with youth. And then our third program is our Farm Stand Social Enterprise, which is like a culmination of all things. So, you know, people know that in, in the neighborhood in Compton, the, the west side of Compton, um, we're, open, we're open every other week from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on a converted, a, a softball field that was abandoned, probably I'd say for the last 10 years on the, on the plot of a, of a local parish church that for years did not have the means to, to do that upkeep. So we were lucky enough to have a relationship with a then pastor who granted us access to that space. So we needed, we needed some buy-in because it was kind of the first time it was, it was being done on this property to develop it. Prior to the space in Compton, we, we, we dabbled with like small backyard spaces only to realize over time that we needed to develop specs, like how much land do we need? How much access do we need? Because essentially the same amount of work being put into a small ass backyard <laughs> is the same amount of work you would do in a large space. Yeah. And it kind of really is. And it just doesn't look as messy when it's a bigger space. But we, we went from backyards to, um, partnerships with with institutions that already have access to community so we're, we're we're standing on those shoulders we farm on about three quarters of an acre in compton and we also farm in about three quarters of an acre in san pedro that's awesome yeah actually that kind of jumps me around to another question i had for you which were where are all the locations of your farms in south la so my backyard in east la is still we still grow here i have about 10 raised beds and I've, I've been better. I don't want to be that guy who, who, you know, for work we do it and we do it well. So everywhere else, everything's growing well. One of the homies that we worked with once helped me in my backyard and he says, man, it looks neglected. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> and I, from that point forward, I, was like, I am not letting this thing get out of hand. So we actually grow a lot of flowers in this backyard. Awesome. Uh, and then, our other location and our flagship farm is in Compton, right off of um, Redondo Beach Boulevard and Avalon. And then we have uh, our farm in San Pedro. We have 1.0 and 2.0. 1.0 is, is a 5,000 square foot lot that we started off a few years back. And in the last two years, we transformed two vacant lots across the street 
So we have about, I'd say roughly 20,000 square feet of growing in San Pedro. It's a different place too. You know, microclimates are different. Some things do better in East LA. Some things do really well in Pedro and, and other things really thrive in Compton. So each, each place has its charm. How did you guys choose like where, what plot of land you're going to use or like where you are going to set up? And, you know, I'm sure it's hard to come across relatively large plots of land in the middle of South LA. <laughs> it, it is. It, it, I think it's, it's a misconception that there's, there's a lot of vacant land because a lot of land really is owned. And mm -hmm. I think with, with, with a market where real estate is a competitive market, you know, people are just waiting to sell for when the price is up. But generous benefactors who've said, hey, I have this space, you could use it. So the church and re really the, the archdiocese, the Catholic church here in, in Los Angeles was generous enough to say, hey, we have this space, it's, it's available for this purpose. Besides all that, of that, I think the land, I, I feel looking back that the land chose us more than anything else. We, we were just kind of looking for any real chance to do this, but we had specs. You know, South L.A., Compton, disproportionately more parolees, higher food insecurity. So it kind of made sense that that's where we would land. Mm -hmm. Totally. I like, want to get back into that in a second. But I know you had mentioned people, plants, and places. Or Erica might have mentioned this to me when I was <laughs> chatting with her, your partner. Can you share that philosophy with us a little bit more about why those things are so important to you and your work and how it kind of becomes a red thread through all that you do? Yeah, I think early on, you know, we're, we're talking about how did we decide on space and then reflecting, I say space kind of decides decides us or chooses us. I adhere to, to the law of reciprocity. There, there's, a, there's a give and take and give and take. And it happens over and over again. But it, it's not just between people. It's between people and plants and the places we inhabit. Those three elements we highlight as, as essential to thrive. I think our plant life has a lot to teach us. The land has a lot to teach us. I kind of move from the, the, hey, let's develop this space to like, hey, let's work with this space as the space starts to develop us. I think it's, it's captured in, 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 um, in the story of Moy, who was an ex-lifer who, who visited us at a, at a farm stand. He used to work with us in developing these farms. And, you know, he went from isolation to, to his own integration. But he remarked when he saw the farm stand active, kind of how you saw it, the land was once fallow and now it's fruitful. Yeah. And so his life became that. But I, I, I think that's because we, we honor the relationships between uh, plants and, and people and, and the, the sort of place that creates. You know, you were there on Sunday, and I, I know that people kind of are like, Let, let's get our vegetables or let's get brunch or let's hang out so the kids could play. For me, th that Sunday is, is, a, is a culmination of when relationships get celebrated. <laughs> it is the case that... Most people, most people really will say they leave the farm feeling better. And, and I think that's because of the plants that they interact with. Yeah. Uh, I think there's an energy emitted and even from the soil. So I, you know, that's kind of how I look at it. No, and I appreciate that because exactly what we're all about here is that interconnection between community, you know, people, the planet, which is like, are the plants and the the ecosystems and the land in which we're living on and us as individuals and how are, are all those things in relationship with one another. So I think everything you're saying is just hitting the nail right on the head. Um, but I'm going to switch gears a little bit over toward the group in which you support, which is incredibly important to this community, which I know um, Alma Backyard Farm serves a historically marginalized group of formerly incarcerated individuals. Um, and can you provide a bit more detail about around this intention to support this group of folks and perhaps some of the challenges that that they may face in society today sure prior to working and and, and developing and helping to create alma backyard farms i was involved in in, in prison ministry and, and juvenile hall ministry and you know it's it's kind of a posture of listening that allowed for me to to gain insight into 
what it is people would want to do if they had a chance to come back home. And <clears throat> consistently, people would say they, they would want to, to give back because they, they, they recognize and regret having, you know, taken from the community, harmed the community. So I think the converse or the opposite of that would be to, to, to be helpful to the community, but, but you need a space to do that. And so part of my hope with having listened to people who were locked up is to create an opportunity for a paradigm shift to happen where it's, it's easy to stir up resistance to welcoming people by just eliciting a sense of fear of the unknown, you know, like yeah, we could generate that fear by making somebody who's had a history of incarceration become so other that a relationship with them would, would no longer be uh, conceived of. And I think what, what needs to take place is if the desire of somebody who's been locked up is to give back, if society is a place that welcomes that, how could we honor those desires if somebody's paid their dues? In the city of Los Angeles, it seems like with the amount of vacant land available and the amount of parolees around and, and the high food insecurity, we looked at it like, you know, these problems or what could be conceived of problems could actually be uh, an asset of high value. So like working with folks who are locked up, I think they're more interested in a chance before getting a check, but they need a supportive environment to do so. The farm has become that environment because it's a, it, it, it allows for a slow introduction back into community. But I, you know, we're at a point where I, I think, you know, we, we highlight that we work with folks who've been locked up, but I, I, I think even that approach, it, it's necessary to, 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 you know, like, you're competing for, for funding because you need money to do the work. But I think if I look at it now and I want to express it as I, as I really want to, I rather know the names of the people there before their histories. Yeah. Um, so there are great people there who have a past, but I think sometimes the emphasis on that precludes looking at their potential into the future. So what the farm does with folks who are locked up, the conversation there is around the food. Mm -hmm. And so you're, everyone is at the table. You know what I mean? It's ver yeah. everyone's at the table versus, oh, who's this guy or who's this girl? And what did she do? You don't even really think about that anymore because you're like, hey, we're, we're at this table. And, and um, you know, I, people have remarked that that the energy and service is so good. And I think that's an expression of, of our team's commitment to give back. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it started from, from listening to those stories. We're not everything to everybody. Folks who are leaving incarceration, some people may gravitate to other things. Some people have found education as their freedom. So going to college is their thing. But, but there are people who just want to be physical and sweat. And the, the one other thing I would mention is you know, people who've done time and they've sat inside prison for a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very thrilled to see them experience immediate gratification when they've made the connection between seeing something they have put in the ground, they've harvested it. It's on the table for people to pick and they see people taking it home. Yeah. Because in a way it's like taking a, a piece of them home. And that's, that's what I think happens. That's so, I mean, that's so beautiful. That visual that you just shared is so true. Like, I think at the end of the day, the whole issue with so many groups is that we put labels on them and when we should just be looking at what, who people are as people in that moment. Right. And I think it's exactly what you were saying, like, rather than defining who, who people were, what had happened, it's like, let's be together in this moment at the table and build something together that's beautiful moving forward, you know? And I, I love the way you put that. I think that's so well said. And on the spirit of what we're all about at Alchemy, I wanted to get your perspective on 
how bridging the gap between personal community and planetary well-being is tied to food justice and urban farming. So what role do you think food justice and urban farming can play in helping to create this collective well-being for all? So our approach to farming is entirely relational. The, our philosophy at the farm is, is, is you know, we, we need to develop a supportive community so that each individual member could unlock their potential and become the better version of themselves, right? So a collection is, 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 is made up of many things, right? Like just in my experience of that, how the farm, how urban farming leads to collective well-being is that at the very least, the proclamation at the farm is this, that our collective well-being relies on each and every member of this collective. But just like one seed gets planted at a time, one leaf gets harvested at a time, one person gets employed at a time. It, it's slow work and it's a process that really requires that we, we take up individual responsibility for collective well-being. Yes. Um, and it's not like this selfish thing of like, oh, I got to take care of myself. Yeah, you do, because we depend on you as an individual to have this collective well-being. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if that answers it, but I, I think we start, our way of reasoning is like, we start one at a time. Like we have to start it with one backyard at a time. You, you can't scale something if you don't start with the one thing first. Yep. I, I think, I think that's, that's my look. Yeah, know. it's like one foot in front of the other. <laughs> one foot in front of the other. Because yeah. the, the problem, like if, if we're going to, if we're going to tackle this, you know, We've had things like the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war. You know, if we really launched wars, then it seems like the strategy sucks. Honestly. <laughs> yes, yes. Because, you know, like it's it, it, there's no victory. If, yeah. you, if you name everything we've we've launched a war on, there's no victory in it. And I think their they're victory in celebrating our interdependence and our collective well-being it happens one person at a time. Yes. And, and this is a repeated process. So I think urban farming, like our, our way of doing it, it, it what, what it does is it, it shows that small incremental steps compounded over years will, will lead to indisputable collective well-being. Yes. Yeah, I love you know? that. That's so spot on. And I think exactly what we're all about here and trying to share that message with others that we are interdependent and we need to build reciprocity with these one another and understand that there is that connection that starts with us as individuals. And if we are not well, we can't show up in service for our community or the planet. Um, and that needs us as well. So love it. Last thing, last question for you, uh, Richard, is that we always want to give a call to action to our community here at Alchemy. Um, so what are one or two things that our community can do today to address whether that's restorative or food justice here in Los Angeles or even in their own direct community? One thing. <clears throat> so I, I could say, you know, you could sign up. You know, we have a volunteer opportunity. I could go that route. But I, I think in, in a world where where it seems that so many relationships are, are frigid and rigid you know, here, here's here's kind of something we do at the farm uh, before we start the day. So we usually have a, a huddle, what we call a huddle. And I know people are so eager to get going. And if you ask me if we could do one thing collectively as as individuals is to take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you were to ask me, let's just all take a deep breath, you know, and kind of let that lead the way. Because I think as much as I want to be inclined to say, hey, call to action, do this, I, I, would, I would call an action to pause and reflect. So if, if people could take one minute to focus on their breathing, start there. And then there are opportunities 
out there where people could get concretely involved. But I, I, I think taking a breath is wholly concrete. When I, when I get on Instagram or I turn on the news, it's very depressing. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just think, what if we just all took a deep breath together? recognizing that we all breathe the same air. Maybe that will do some good. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, Richard, that was like probably the best way we could wrap up our conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy day. I know you guys are all very busy um, to have this conversation with us. I'm beyond thrilled to, to share it with our community. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks so much. Thank you for, for having me. I, I look forward to seeing you again and maybe we'll chat next time at the farm. Yes, for sure. Thanks for listening to the Alchemy Podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation today, you can find more about the speaker in our show notes below. In order to build a global community committed to well-being for all, we need your help. So please rate and subscribe to wherever you're listening from. Finally, we cannot do this without the help of our amazing team. A huge thank you and shout out to Lindsay Todd, producer. All right, y'all have a lovely, lovely day.